Last week we talked about worship and what worship is and kind of some different concepts of worship. And as I thought through kind of where should we go next, uh, one of the places that occurred to me was what do we do when we don't feel like worshiping? What do we do when worship gets tough? What do we do when everything's falling apart and it just doesn't come natural to worship? Because our, our kind of concept theme was, hey, I want to worship. And if I want to worship God, I understand that all I'm doing is I am, I'm loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, Scripture says. That's a great definition of worship. It came from Jesus, so we thought we'd just stick with that. That's what it means to worship. Just love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that's really easy when things are good. Well, what about when things get tough and my mind isn't in it? What about when my heart's broken and I actually blame God and I'm, I'm, I'm upset with God and I'm, I'm like, God, I, my heart doesn't want to worship it. wants to hate you right now. What about when my soul is so distracted by all the problems in life that, that last week while we talked about magnifying God, it's actually demagnified God and the problems are so magnified that I can't even find God in the midst of all that I'm going through. So today I want to introduce you to two, two kind of thoughts. There's easy worship and there's willful worship. The easy worship is uh, an easy one to kind of concept, so we don't have to think through that much. But willful worship is when things are not good. It's when the bills are huge, when your relationships are on the rock, when your spouse says to you, I don't think we're going to make it. When the kids have pushed you to your knees and they're still on your back climbing, saying, I want more time, more time, more energy. And you're thinking to yourself, I just want to sleep. See, a, a lot of moms in the audience right now going, amen. It's when you've lost your job and your pension and you're driving home trying to figure out how am I going to break this to my family. It's when you walk out of the hospital room and the six-year-old kid is dying of cancer. It's when your heart, soul, mind, and strength no longer feel like they want to worship because you even question whether or not the God, the Father's Day God, the good God, the Our Father who art in heaven, and you, you pray to this Father and you begin to go, how can I reconcile a loving Father with what I'm experiencing here on earth? I no longer feel like I can worship. It's when we cry out Psalm 43. And we see Jason, excuse me, we see David at the end of it as he literally stares at his own soul and he lines up the psalm and he's got this this column right here where he starts to stack up his problems and he says, "Why my soul are you downcast?" You ever talk to yourself in third person? That's what David's doing. He like looks at his own soul here and he says, well, why are you downcast? And if you crawl into the psalm, David literally then begins to stack up. You have to answer the question. Well, let me tell you why. The soul responds because this, 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 this. And the, 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 the column just keeps rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. And, 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 and David responds, well, why are you so disturbed within me? This makes sense now. I see all the problems that you're focused on. And then David does something amazing in the midst of this prayer. He chooses willful worship. He chooses it. See, it's a choice we make that says, I'm going to worship God in spite of or even because of, but in the midst of for certain. Because I don't think God's going to and all those issues, that column's going to disappear. But in the midst of staring at the column, David says to his troubles and his soul, put your hope in God. And he says, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. I will choose to willfully worship God, even with all this going on. Dr. Walter Sennett Armstrong is a professor of philosophy at Dartmouth College. And he had a debate with Dr. William Craig Lane. And if you're into apologetics at all, meaning how do you understand and defend your faith, how do you reconcile God and reality, uh, he has a debate 
between the two doctors, and it is a powerful debate. I put it on my Facebook page. Uh, I think Megan's going to be able to tag it out and get it on the church Facebook page. It's a, it's a, it's a, a reading of the debate, uh, and so I like that because then I actually get to slow down and process it a little better. Uh, it's worth it uh, if you have the time to read it, but it's, it's a little heavy. But basically, this is how it starts out. Uh, Dr. Armstrong gives this story of this child who is born and born into life with all kinds of pain and suffering because of all the situations and, and the mother situation. And the child is literally born and immediately introduced into terrible suffering. And the screams of the baby are piercing. And he talks about the nurses quickly decide that, that they can't help and save the child. And the doctor says, we can't save the child. And they introduce a morphine drip to the child. And, and it's not long. And they're just waiting for the baby to die. Just waiting for the baby to end its suffering. Dr. Armstrong says this about that. He says, this is why I don't believe there is a God. Certainly not a loving God as Christians talk about. Let me explain why, he says. Suppose a doctor could have cured a child and enabled the child to live a normal, happy life with a simple operation. An operation that would not have cost much or harmed anybody or deprived any other patients of needed care. But the doctor chooses not to save the baby. Why? Let's just give the best through logical reason I can think of. The doctor didn't feel like operating that day. Professor Armstrong says, I would consider such a doctor to be a moral monster. Just to let a child die under those circumstances, the doctor would be a moral monster. And I assume most of you would agree with me. Now, if you believe in Christianity, you can't help but apply the same set of circumstances to your God. He goes on to talk about you talk about this God who has all this power, all this might, this all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God. Do whatever he wants to do. And every day, children are born suffering. People are born suffering. People die suffering. And God seems to not only allow, but Dr. Armstrong says God actually encourages and enjoys people's suffering. Evil, therefore, and suffering are the reason... Professor Armstrong does not believe in God. The problem of pain and suffering and evil are not new to us. In fact, you may notice, and you may be sitting there going, hey, I think we heard a sermon about this just a couple months ago. You know what? We do this about every quarter. Because this is one of the number one reasons why people don't believe in Jesus. In fact, it may be the number one reason. I have yet to meet an atheist or a skeptic or an unchurched person who says to me, I've got lots of logical, reasonable reasons to not believe in Jesus, and I rest on them, and I want to talk to you about them. Because they're absolutely foolproof. They're bulletproof. You can't shoot holes in any of them, Aaron. And I sit down with them, and I talk to these people, and you peel back one, maybe two layers, because the logic falls apart. The story of Jesus withstands every test you can put to it. What you find is once you pull back one or two layers, it's not because it doesn't make sense that we don't believe in Jesus. It's because I had this experience and I can't reconcile my experience to the loving Jesus. My experience is if God really loved and cared, He would have saved so-and-so from. My experience says, when my mom died of this disease and I was in a hospital daily watching her suffer, my experience says, Grandma had terrible dementia and it was so tragic, I can't imagine a loving God. My experience says, that car wreck took the life. My experience says this, my experience says this, therefore I can't believe in a loving God. What do we as a church do with that? In fact, it's not unique to those outside the church, is it? Even those of us who gather every Sunday run into this. In fact, not only do we run into this, but one of the reasons why about every quarter we talk about this problem of pain and evil and suffering is because, guess what? You are sitting beside someone who's still alive. I'm glad to hear no one was shocked by that. 
And what I mean by that is that the person next to you endures life and they have different circumstances that occur. And about every quarter, here's what I know. Every quarter we preach a sermon like this or we do a message like this and about a quarter of the people in the church go, man, did I need that? Because I was like wrestling with my faith. I was lost. And I know you've talked about it before, but I needed somebody to say to me, it makes sense still to believe in Jesus in spite of and even because of what I'm going through. Here is a thought for you. Because I just want you to know I'm not going to answer the problem of the baby born that was suffering. I don't ever answer questions that can't be answered. I don't have the ability to explain God. In fact, here's the problem. Often we as a church try to insert an explanation where there shouldn't be. In fact, you and I have actually heard people say bad theology and speak into situations where you're like, oh, that's terrible. Right? You and I have heard someone say like, hey, that, that baby would have grown up and then had this terrible, tragic suffering. I mean, he would have been hit by a car and, and, and that's the reason God took that baby home, right? And I want to say, like, hey, don't put words in there where God leaves the blank. Let's not try to make it easier on God to get out of trouble, right? Let's just live in the mystery and the, the frustration of it, right? So here's my thought. You and I only know something's wrong because you and I know there is an ought. You and I know there's an ought. The way things ought to be. In our souls, we sense there's a way things ought to be. Because we know there's an ought to the way things ought to be, all right, we believe. And what I mean by that is, is this. Let me give you a story. Jimmy, <clears throat> this is a, an old story. My grandmother used to tell it. Jimmy raised his hand one day and said to his teacher, Miss Parker, I don't believe in God anymore. She looked down at the student, and she said, Fair enough, Jimmy. We'll play your game today. None of us in this classroom are going to believe in Jesus or God today. You can tell how old the story is because the teacher said Jesus in the school. It wasn't when she stubbed her toe either. <clears throat> so she says, We're going to play your game. We're going to say none of us believe in Jesus. And she said, Therefore the consequences are there's no more right and wrong. There's no more good or bad. There's no more evil or suffering. It just is. The fourth grade class kind of looked around at each other, not sure what that meant or what the consequences really of not believing in God were. Little Jimmy was excited. None of us believe in Jesus anymore. There's this long pause in the classroom as the fourth grade students continue to look at each other. And then it was the pastor's kid who acted out. It's always the pastor's kid. The pastor's kid stands up Walks over to Jimmy's desk, grabs the bottom legs, and flips it upside down. This guy's my hero, by the way. I'm like, awesome. If we're not going to have rules, let's just go big time, right? Jimmy immediately stands up, almost ready to fight the kid, and remembers you're not supposed to do that. Miss Parker! He, Tommy, he, he flipped my desk over! Miss Parker calmly looked at Jimmy and said, I understand. There's no more good or bad, though. Remember, we don't believe in God at all. As Miss Parker told the story later, she would say, and praise God, the bell rang at that moment. She said, I wasn't sure where we were going. Every student would flip their desk over. The bell rang and every kid lined up in the front of the room to head out to recess. And guess who complained? Jimmy. Miss Parker, she cut in front of me. Jimmy, remember, we don't believe in God. There's no more rules, no more right or wrong, no more good or bad, no more suffering or glory. Out at the recess, Jimmy was playing tag, and guess who got hurt? Jimmy came over to Miss Parker with a skinned up knee. Sally pushed me. It's always a Sally that's a pushy lady. Sally pushed me. Miss Parker knelt down beside him and said, Jimmy, why shouldn't Sally push you? You're not supposed to push somebody. Why, Jimmy? Because it's not the way we treat each other. Why, Jimmy? Because it's not the way it's supposed to be. Listen. We only know there is an ought. The way things should be because there is a God. 
Let me give it to you this way. In a world void of a loving creator, where we are nothing more than molecules rambly, randomly jumbled together, there is no problem with pain and suffering because there's no ultimate purpose and no story of a loving God in charge of creating. There's no problem with pain and suffering and there is no ought and a story void of God. It is only when there is a loving creator introduced into the story that there is an ought Molecules randomly jumbled together don't have oughts. They have one. Oh, that looks too bad. It is in the midst of this that I sometimes say to people, your anger, your frustration with God and at God are sometimes one of the best things you can do with God. Because I imagine as you're upset about what's going on in life, and you take it to God, and even when you're angry at God, He picks you up in His arms and says, Thank you for being angry. I'm glad that there are people who still understand the ought of life. The righteousness that is in me is in you, and I'm glad you're upset at the situation too. And in the midst of your child faith, I understand that you wrestle with blaming me. I just want you to know, I agree with you. Life is not as it ought to be. I want to take you to Luke 7. If you've got a Bible, I want you to open it up. If you've got your app, open up Luke 7. Because we're not the first persons to rescue with, wrestle with this. We're not the first persons to say to God, Life's not as it ought to be. Life's not where it should be. And I don't know how to willfully worship because I am the only person to ever deal with this situation. We're not. We open up Luke 7, and it is one of the most frustrating chapters in all the Bible to me. And so I want to introduce you to a frustrating chapter and maybe help you see it again in new eyes. You ready? Luke 7. And here's what I want you to do. I'm going to walk you through kind of Luke 7 and hurry. I want you to go home later then and read through it again and go, man, he is right on topic. He has nailed this one, okay? Luke 7 starts out with this. It's two powerful stories at the very beginning. Two powerful healing stories, ready? The first one in Luke 7 is that Jesus goes and heals a servant of a Roman centurion. Jesus doesn't even go to the house. He just says the word. But it's a Roman centurion, a non-Israelite citizen, someone who probably doesn't even believe in God. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But he cares for the Jews. And so he sends servants to ask Jesus to heal one of his servants. There is no gain materially. There is no popularity gain. There is nothing in this for Jesus from you and I and the human eyes that say, hey, this was a good a work that Jesus should have done because this moved the kingdom of God forward this way. In the story, Jesus heals someone that didn't have any progression that you and I can visibly read in the kingdom of God other than Jesus is a loving, caring person. But he heals someone that is a Roman centurion servant. It is an amazing story if you understand the politics of the time. Then the next one's even cooler because there's a widow whose son has died. Now the fact that she's a widow means that her husband can't care for her socially and economically. But now that her son, her only son has died, means that she is destitute and in poverty. And her future looks extremely grim. So there's a social economic situation. And then there's the, hey, I just lost my only son. Probably lost my husband not too long ago. And this woman is sobbing and weeping and wailing. Jesus encounters her. And it's a beautiful story where it says, Jesus' heart was touched. Why? Because that's the God we serve. His heart is occasionally touched by how we behave and what we grieve. That's the way God works. He doesn't stand off to the side and go, I don't care. He intervenes and cares with us and weeps with us. And so Jesus does this really cool thing. He walks up and he touches the coffin and the boy comes to life. It's the resuscitation of life. Jesus just touches the coffin. How cool is that? And so we have these two stories at the beginning of Luke. And you've got to see how Luke puts the, the passages together. So we have the story of healing of the centurion servant, and then we have the story of the raising of the widow's son. Right? And almost, if you stare at him like that, you begin to get this theme like Jesus is Superman. Here's a problem, Jesus. He shows up. He saves the day. Oh, there's another problem. Jesus shows up and saves the day. You see his cape flaring in the back. And by the way, anytime you can throw Jesus on the screen of the Superman picture, you have succeeded a great sermon. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm just saying, like, it doesn't matter what I do from here on out. You can all walk away going, probably best sermon ever. Jesus wore a Superman outfit, right? Right? But that's what it looks like. You read Luke 7 and the first two stories, like Jesus is just flying around, saving the day. He shows up. Here's another crisis. In swoops Jesus. Here's another crisis. In swoops Jesus, right? And so we get to the next story. And if you're building and you're kind of working up a theme, or if you're creating a story, not telling the real story, but you're making one up, this next story is the wrong way to do it. In fact, if you're Luke and you're putting these together, you mess with my theology right here. You mess with my Superman Jesus and you reintroduce the real Jesus. And I don't always like it. And this is where I think Luke 7 bothers me. And I want you to be bothered by it too, at least enough to go, wow, am I so glad that that chapter bothers me and he puts these stories in this order. Remember, we've got Superman Jesus. And our next story is about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist is not the guy that writes the Gospel of John. John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, son of Elizabeth and Zacharias. And remember, they were barren and couldn't have kids, and they were old, right? And Zacharias goes into the temple, and he prays to God, and an angel says, you're going to have a baby. And Zacharias can't talk when he comes out. And Elizabeth, in her old age, has a child, and it's John the Baptist. And he's a crazy dude. He's a weird dude. He's a radical. He's a fanatic. The guy lives out in the desert. He wears these skins that are itchy. He eats locusts and honey. He's got hair that's wild. People go out to, like, have half a spectacle, like, what are you doing today? I don't know. I thought we were, like, kind of bored. We're going to go see crazy John the Baptist out in the desert. And he's dunking people in the river Jordan, and he's saying to people things that you can't say to people anywhere else or anybody else unless you're John the Baptist because he missed all the political correct classes in school. You know, the classes that teach you what you can and can't say. John missed every one of them, okay? And so, like, people are showing up, and he looks to the teachers of the law and the leaders, and he says to them, you brood of vipers, you dirty snakes, you dirty rotten scoundrels, right? Now, John the Baptist then says, you got to repent, and he takes people and he dunks them in the water. Thank you for those of you that caught the movie reference. And he's dunking him in the water. He's dunking him in the water. He says, repent! The kingdom of God is near! Repent! The kingdom of God is near! And he's expecting this movement of Jesus uh, to come and to rescue. And then remember, he has this moment where Jesus actually shows up. They're doing like a family reunion at the River Jordan. Jesus starts walking down, right? And John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. And John come, Jesus comes down and, and, and says, I want you to baptize me. And John says, Look, I, I shouldn't even untie your shoes. Like, you baptize me, Jesus. And Jesus says, John, I need you to do this. And John baptizes him. He dunks him in the water. And we have this voice from heaven that begins to speak. And it says, the spirit falls down on Jesus like a dove. Remember what the voice says? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, all that is just to help you understand who John the Baptist is. Because John the Baptist can't keep his mouth shut. And here's what happens. Herod the Great, who kills the babies with Jesus, remember this guy? He dies but has three sons that he's let live. And why I say he's let live is because he killed a bunch of his own sons afraid they were going to take over the kingdom. That's how nice he was, right? Which also sets the stage for, hey, great daddy figure. I'm going to be a great man, right? And Herod has three sons. One of them gets like exiled immediately by Rome because he's so evil and so ruthless. And they take him out of leadership immediately. He has two more sons. Both of them are also called Herod. All right? And one of the Herods, all right, because they just couldn't come up with any more names, all right, is Herod Antipas. And he rules over Galilee, and Herod Antipas does this crazy thing, and he starts sleeping with his brother's wife, which even back then was kind of a no-no thing to do. You just don't sleep with your brother's wife, okay? Nod your head if you're like, yeah, even today that's no good, right? Yeah, uh, good, we're all on board, all right? But Herod starts sleeping with his brother's wife, and, and you know the story. John the Baptist says, hey, you shouldn't do that. Why? Because John the Baptist couldn't keep his nose out of other people's business, right? And there's this public affair, and he's the one that's so radical out in the desert. He starts telling people, and Herod's a terrible dude. He's sleeping with his brother's wife. He's going to hell. He's a terrible guy. Herod gets tired of hearing it and puts him in jail. Now, jail, during the time of Jesus, wasn't like you and I think of jail today, where there's a weight room, and you got the dining commons, and you got the yard to play in, and you got TV to watch, and it's just a wonderful social time for the most part. Right? Jail was a dungeon, all right? And maybe a cave. 
And wherever space you have on, you're either chained to the wall or there are prison bars all around you. And your bed is here and your bathroom's here and your food place is right here and the rats are right there. And you don't really have any place to get away from that little spot that you have. And in fact, normally the way you ate was that friends and family would bring you in a meal. Or else you would starve to death in, in prison. Or they would bribe the guard not to torture and beat you. And so it's kind of this place you don't want to be. When you think of like, hey, we're going on vacation this year, Disney World, let's go back to ancient dungeons. It's not really a toss-up, right? Immediately we're going to Disney World, right? And so John the Baptist is in jail. Now the reason all that is important is because, let me ask you a question. How long do you sit staring at a terrible, dark situation before you begin to have your faith kind of rocked and you doubt? How long does it take for you to begin to feel the, the emotional walls close in on you and you begin to go, hey God, uh, what are you doing here? Let me, let me put it to you in a personal way. <clears throat> Here's kind of where I see this working like I'm seeing John the Baptist, and I'm seeing John the Baptist have this conversation with God in jail. He's like, you know, <clears throat> I've been doing everything you've asked me to do. And I, I mean, you, you're the one that said, hey, go tell Herod, stop sleeping with your brother's wife. I mean, you told me to do that. I'm doing exactly what you called me to do. And then all these false accusations and all these people kind of started saying negative things. And now I'm like... In jail, I don't know if you noticed God, but that's currently where I reside, right? Run 100 North Jail Street, and now I'm here, and it's really not that fun. And I just kind of thought that if I would follow you and do what you wanted to do, that this would not be how the end of my story worked out. I kind of thought maybe you and I would do the whole Elijah thing, like a chariot of fire, like that's how I want to go out. Not, And then John the Baptist died lonely and isolated in jail, terrible death. God, I just... I'm doing what you want me to do. I kind of thought it would go different. And you and I have a story like that, right? Where you thought, man, this is, this is not how I thought this would end. What do you mean I've got diagnosed with this? What do you mean I don't have this job? What do you mean my kid has it? What do you mean? God, I'm doing everything I know how to do. I'm following you. This isn't how the story should go. You should take care of those who follow you. Aren't you the good, good father Chris Tomlin sings about? That liar. Here's where John the Baptist's story picks up. Luke 7, verse 18. Remember, we have superhero Jesus just ran to both places, saved the day. This is John the Baptist, his cousin, the guy who baptized him. Right hand of the mission of the kingdom of God right now. John's disciples go to him in jail and it says that they told him about these things, what Jesus was doing. So he calls two of them and he says to them, Go to the Lord and ask, Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Which is really a weird question for someone who heard the voice from heaven say, This is the one, right? But again, put yourself in John the Baptist's situation. How long do you spend in jail before you begin to go, hey, maybe I missed the point. And I love the answer. I love the answer, ready? Luke 7, verse 21. It says, at that very time, meaning while John's asking this, Jesus is doing this, it says, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits. He gave sight to many who were blind. So Jesus replies to the messengers, go back and tell John what's going on that you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Good news is preached to the poor. Go back and tell this message to John because John's in jail and he wants to know if I'm the one who is to come or not and I want to answer him with a riddle. Like that's what Jesus does, right? Because if I'm John the Baptist and I'm in jail, possibly facing my death, I'm really excited to hear, hey, good news, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. Like, cool. How does that answer what I want to know? Because what do I really want to know? Jesus, when you're coming to get me out, when's the rebellion? Right? Where's the stormtroopers at, Jesus? That's what I want to know. Right? Get your daggone lightsaber out. Come cut the bars out. We'll all march out of here. Cool. Right? So how does this answer at all, Jesus, answer to John's question? Let me show you this to you. 
First of all, Jesus is literally quoting a passage out of Isaiah. Literally quoting a passage out of Isaiah about what the Messiah will do when he comes. And the reason this answers John's question is because this is not what John was expecting the Messiah to do. And that's why this is so important for us to know because this is the place where my spiritual faith and what I want God to do and what God really does collide. Because John is expecting who? The warrior king. The David who's going to come in and end the tyranny of Rome. The oppression they're enduring. Because when you're in jail and life falls apart and you and I have been there, when everything else falls apart and you are being tormented and it's just bad and outside is being unfair, you and I don't want Jesus who dies on the cross. You and I want Jesus who's going to show up at the second coming to come now and save us. Set things right. Jesus' answer to John is basically, I know you want the warrior king. That's not who I am yet. I've come not to save you from human suffering. I came to give life purpose through suffering. What? And in Jesus' next statement, all right, it's perhaps one of the most powerful statements. One of, it should be one of like your most favorite statements in all of the Bible, but yet one of your most frustrating. Ready? He says this, Luke 7, verse 23. Jesus closes his message to John's messengers. Go back and tell John this. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Huh? Like I can literally see John's messengers kind of like, wait, say that again. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Okay. Is John going to know what that means? We don't know what that means, Jesus. At least that's how I did it. I mean, I went through high school and college going, I'm not sure what Jesus means, but in fact, this whole story is kind of baffling to me. So let me translate it to you. Jesus is basically saying, look, I'm not what you're expecting. We're not coming stormtroopers, break down the door. The A-team is not involved right now. It's just me, and that's not my mission. In fact, Jesus says to John, blessed are you if you believe even when I don't do what you want, how you want it, when you want it. Blessed are you if when I don't act like Santa Claus, you still believe. Blessed are you, John, because you're going to die in prison. I'm not coming to rescue you. Blessed are you if you don't lose faith because of that or account of me and what I'm not doing. Wow. Wow. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, like maybe Jesus isn't really as big a fan as John the Baptist is, when you read this chapter later tonight, read the next part, because Jesus then spends the next part of the chapter just building up John, talking about how great he is. And it's like, well, wait a second, Jesus. You just supermaned here with the, the servant of the centurion. You supermaned over here with the dead son. Superman here with John the Baptist. Jesus, if you ever needed a place to superman, this is the right-hand guy. Save the day! And Jesus says, no, nope, it's not going to happen here. Again, remember that irritation I told you about with God? This is where that comes in because I'm like, what? Like if anybody should be saved, this is the guy. And then Jesus doesn't give us an explanation. If Jesus had said, and by the way, John was diagnosed with cancer and it was going to be this terrible, 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 tragic death. We would all go, well, okay, we gave God an out. That's why Jesus lets him behead. It doesn't say anything like that. In fact, we just live in the mystery of Scripture that I'm so thankful is there because I'm not the first person to wrestle with that doesn't make sense. And it's in the Bible. How awesome is that? Because if we were going to make up the story, we wouldn't leave these really difficult, confusing places in the Scripture. And as long as I leave it here and don't apply it to my life, it's okay. But the minute I move it into my life and then I go... Yeah, that's kind of like what you did with my sister, God. When she died of cancer, you were kind of like, I'm not coming to rescue. I don't care how many times you prayed. Well, what about that kid in the hospital who prayed with cancer? He was six years old. Yeah, I'm not coming to rescue him either. And it's not that I don't care. It's just not what I'm going to do. And I hear the voice of God repeat the last lines here. Blessed are you if you believe in me, even when I don't do what you want, when you want it, how you want me to do it. Blessed are you if you believe, even though I don't act like Santa Claus. 
there's these three guys that have a very similar story. They're called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And uh, they're faced with king, the, the, the mightiest king in the world at the time. And he says to them, hey, I want you to either worship the statue of me. Talk about a self-indulgent narcissistic complex, right? So he's built this statue of me. He says, either worship the statue of me or I'm going to throw you in this giant toaster. And I've turned it up on high. All right. And these three guys stare at the king and stare at their death. And before they know how the story ends, because you and I know how the story ends, and we're like, oh, easy decision. But they don't know how the story ends. And they say this powerful statement, one of the most powerful statements in all Scripture. They say, oh, king, our God can save us. I mean, our God can. And he can rescue anytime he wants, any way he wants. But even if he does not, we will not worship your idol. This is basically what Jesus says. Have the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Blessed are you if you don't fall away on account of me. Jesus is basically saying, when I don't do what you want, proclaim this truth. Our God can and he could have, but he didn't. And we still believe. And by the way, just in case you're wondering in the story, like King Nebuchadnezzar looks at the toaster as like the worst place to be. But if you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you go in and you meet Jesus there, the safest place in the world is hanging out in a giant toaster with Jesus. And at this point in time, Jesus invites us to have willful worship. Worship me even though it's all gone to hell. And the story at this point in time would leave me irritated and absolutely frustrated. And I would think, maybe, maybe we do have an evil God. But then Jesus does an amazing thing and he goes to the cross. And out of the same prophecy book out of Isaiah, we read about what Jesus does for us on the cross. You see, if Jesus doesn't do this, we have a God who doesn't know our, uh, our suffering, our struggles, our strife. But Jesus does. In fact, Isaiah 53 says this, Surely he took upon, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we were considered him punished by God. Stricken by him and afflicted. Jesus was we look at him, we go, the punishment meant for us, Jesus took. He was pierced for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. These aren't words that make you go, ooh, I want to experience that, right? The punishment that was brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way, and the Lord laid upon him our iniquity. And I can't reconcile all the pain and suffering. All I can do is at the end of the day go, but our God understands. And our God didn't choose the easy way out for himself. And so I invite you to willfully worship God even when it's tough. And proclaim, I will be blessed and I will not fall away on account of. Dr. William Craig Lane responds to Armstrong's attacks upon our faith with two thoughts. The first one is so powerful, that's kind of almost all we need. But he says, here, let me just give you two thoughts in response. I'm gonna, I've boiled these down to the absolute essence for you. He says, the purpose of life is not human happiness as such, but knowing God. One of the reasons that evil exists in the world and it seems so pointless is that we naturally assume that if God exists, then the goal of human life is the happiness of the world. God's role is to provide us with the most comfortable environment and possible that we are human pets. But in the Christian view, this is false. We are not God's pets. At the end of life is not a goal of happiness, but rather knowing God. At the end, only union with God brings true and everlasting fulfillment. In a society absorbed and infatuated with running from pain. Here's a pill for it. It hurts. So take this. Here, here, We've got to end all pain. We've got to end all pain. This will make you feel better. Every commercial you witness is about how do we make you happy. In a society that's narcissistic, a selfie society, the message of Jesus isn't I came to end your pain and make you happy. It's I came to give life purpose and meaning and die for your sins. 
second point he makes is, mankind is in a state of rebellion against God and his purposes. We should not be surprised when evil enters into the world. We caused it in the garden. We ate ourselves out of house and home. So what do we do with it? As the band comes forward, I just want to give you a couple thoughts. One, we say to God, I don't know, I don't understand, but thank you for Luke 7 where you didn't give us all the answers. You just said to us, but I'm still God anyways. And you're blessed if you believe in me even when I don't do what you want, how you want, when you want it. And I don't behave like Santa Claus. Will yourself to worship anyways. Because only when you do that will you find fulfillment in life. Go ahead, check me out. Go ahead, challenge my, my history, my credentials. You'll see that I am the only one that you can lean on. For this morning... If this is your story, I invite you to will yourself to worship and proclaim, blessed be the name of the Lord, whether it's good or it's absolutely hell. Blessed be the name of the Lord anyways. Hey, if you're here today and you go... Hey, in a holy spiritual way, that's the, that, that message just punched me in the gut. And as we're singing, blessed be the name, I want that to be my life. But when you started talking about, are we living in hell? And you go, yep, that's me right now. There is a prayer team, literally, go down the center line. To Chris and Steve Holmes are right there ready to pray for you right now. And here's what I don't want. I don't want you to go and say, I just don't have the courage to ask for prayer because that's not how a church should behave. You don't have to reveal anything. They're not going to ask you to tell us all about your past 20 sins. You just walk up to them and say, I need prayer. They're going to say, what do you want prayer about? And then they're going to put a hand on your shoulder and pray over you. And I want you to do that. If you want someone to follow up with you about the message today, send us an email, Facebook, Twitter. Megan is great at this. She'll catch it. She'll flag it. We'll get in touch with you. Regardless, I want you to stand in the truth proclaiming, whether the sun shines, whether the storms come on me, blessed I will be because I won't fall away on account of what Jesus does or does not do. I will worship no matter what because I will will myself to worship. In the name of God the Father Almighty, may you go forth as people who proclaim in every season, our God reigns. You are blessed in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.